All right, guys, bang, bang. I have Fred here with me. They have an incredible story as to how they got the Bitcoin fund approved on the Canadian exchanges, but we're going to get to that in a minute. Thank you so much for doing this, sir. Hey, Pompet, nice to be here. Absolutely. Let's jump right into your background. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where'd you grow up and what did you do before you fell down the Bitcoin and crypto rabbit hole? Wow. You know, first of all, I think I'm I'm running right up there with some of the older guys in crypto. So, uh, uh, so I've done a lot, but, uh, you know, uh, I definitely got the, you know, shall we say the uh, entrepreneurial bug. And it all came from a guy by the name of uh, Howard Kelly. Uh, my best friend was Peter Kelly. He was an artist and my mom was an artist. And they two, the two of them got along really, really well. And Peter's father was president of a company at the time called Guardian Trust Company, which was a big gold trader in the late 70s and, and 80s and had been around forever. And uh, I was in economics and business and gold trading and foreign forex trading. So by the time I was 23, he made me a, a manager of the international forex and precious metal trading operations at this company called Guardian Trust. So here I am, 23 green. And whatever he wanted, I got to do. And Howard was always thinking of the next thing. And he said, well, let's set up a discount brokerage firm. Let's uh, do this or do that. And then at one point in time, he goes, Fred, why don't we list gold, silver, and platinum certificates on the Montreal Stock Exchange? Because investment advisors don't have any way to buy gold for their client. They're not going to stand out in line on the street with a million dollars in cash and get a gold bar and then walk out, you know, and that's what it was like in the, the heydays of the 70s and 80s with inflation going through the roof. So uh, I said, sure, let's do this. And so I, uh, we applied to list gold, silver, and platinum on the Montreal Stock Exchange to the uh, Montreal Quebec Securities Commission at the time. And their first response was, hang on a second, it's volatile, it's non-traditional custodians, and it's used for criminal purposes. Why would we ever list this on the Montreal Stock Exchange? <laughs> so fast forward 40 years later, here I am going, I want to list Bitcoin on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They go, hang on a second, it's volatile, speculative, and used for criminal purposes. Like, what's up with that? Anyways, by 1986, I think Tom sent you a picture of me on the Montreal Gazette as a 26-year-old little rookie. Uh, you know, uh, with a newspaper saying we finally got gold, silver, and platinum certificates listed on the Montreal Stock Exchange, which was really the beginning of investment advisors using gold as a, a you know, an asset diversifier. And that's really uh, where we went. Um, following that, my real claim to fame was I was joined a group of amazing guys. Fidelity Investments had come to Canada, and after spending three years and millions, tens of millions of dollars, they were about to close the operation. It was after the 87 crash. They said, we're dead here. We're going to close it. And a great guy by the name of John Simpson had uh, hired me and a guy named Joe Canavan. And we took the company from $80 million to $7.5 billion in the next four years. So by the time I was like 31 years old, we were running this amazing organization for easily one of the best financial institutions in the world, uh, uh, Fidelity. And it's fun to see... Uh, Abigail Johnson running Fidelity right now. And, you know, you know, I remember slow dancing with her at the Christmas party in the, <laughs> in the late 80s and early 90s. And she is absolutely an amazing, brilliant, wonderful woman. So I have all the utmost respect for her. And uh, so then we went from Fidelity. And uh, then, now this is where I'm going to blow your mind. I left Fidelity. I did a... a I went to do a re-engineering of a brokerage firm to try and get people to invest in what was called the information superhighway, because the information superhighway had just been invented. And I would take out, I'd rent out IMAX theaters, and I'd stand on stage uh, in this IMAX theater, and we would take a dial-up phone and put it on a, uh, 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 you know, on a, uh, a modem, and it would go ee, ding, 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 ding. And on the IMAX theory, all of a sudden, the internet would pop up on the big screen. And it was originally the inter in, you know, uh, inter information superhighway and then the World Wide Web. And I think there were maybe 10 websites in Canada. <laughs> we surfed the 10 websites and showed what people what surfing was about. I come out on stage with a Hawaiian shirt and sunglasses to Surfing USA. So uh, we did that. Uh, and then I left there because I thought I had come up with the best investment 
idea in the history of the world. And the reason was, is I had gone through a divorce and I had a, a beautiful daughter who had like eight sets of grandparents now that I've been remarried. And I had my new son. And the problem was, is for, you know, holidays and birthdays and everything, she would get $100 or $200 or $300. And I said, I said, geez, imagine if there was one company in the world that whenever a child is born, that parents would send $100 to that account at that company, but anywhere in the world. And it wasn't going to be a financial institution. So I came up with the idea for this thing called the Disney Fund. I actually wrote a business plan that was called Imagine, which is a children's storybook about children being born. And every aunt, uncle, and grandparent would do this. So I sent these business plans to the entire board of directors of Disney and their strategic planning committee. I got half of them back saying, we don't, Disney doesn't entertain non-solicited business opportunities. Said, yeah, well, fine. So I decided I could try and get a meeting with Michael Eisner and everybody who says they know him can get him, you know, can't do it. So I called Michael Eisner every morning for about three months and got to speak to, got to know all his assistants and secretaries and everybody, which now is politically incorrect. But uh, finally, the VP of finance said, Freddie, I love the idea. He says, fly to LA. We're doing a strategic planning meeting next week. We're going to get you to come in and present to us. And I'm just going, Mind blown. This is Facebook before Facebook, like every family, every child in the world hooking up together on the Internet. Anyways, uh, my wife and myself and my three month old son flew to L.A., sat in a days in next to the parking lot and nothing after three days. So we went to Kinko's, printed up more business plans, put them in every Mercedes Benz or better in the parking lot. Anyways, finally got the call and said, uh, yeah, it's not going to happen. So I uh, rented a nice Jaguar convertible and drove with my wife and my kid up to Napa Valley. So here we are in Napa Valley enjoying a little bit of a vacation. And I'm reading old Disney um, annual reports. And I find out that Michael Eisner has a cottage about two mountain ranges from me in Vermont. So I had a home in Vermont and 40 acres. And Eisner was just around the corner. So that summer, I sent a couple of business plans to Michael Eisner's house. and. That's when they threatened me with uh, restraining orders. <laughs> so I'm your only I'm your only guest that has almost got a restraining order from Michael Eisner for an investment idea. That is uh, amazing. And, yeah. and so t- take us from there to at what point do you discover Bitcoin? So um, I was running a multi-asset momentum portfolio invented by Jean-Luc Landry and, and Max Lemieux, who are partners of mine. And... And uh, I was down at the ETF conference in Florida in 2014-15. And I met up with Chris Berniski, who I'm sure you know very well, and, and uh, Kathy Wood from ARC. And I'm telling and they had just launched ARC, and I've just launched, I'm running this multi-asset momentum. And I'm going, geez, you know, like every other hedge fund manager, we're looking for that perfect non-correlated asset class. And Chris goes, Well, I've got to tell you about Bitcoin. So well, I've heard about it, I've read about it. Uh, and he says, well, yeah, he says, I said, but there's no way to buy it in a public fund. He said, okay. He says, well, let's put on a quest. And I said, you know what? I could probably get this done in Canada because I did it for gold 40 years earlier. So I did the standard thing. I maxed out my credit card every month, buy a lot of Bitcoin in 2014, 15. And if you read our uh, original prospectus, it's very similar to Chris's book, Crypto Assets. Uh, he, him and Jack Tater wrote a great book called Crypto, Crypto Assets, Bitcoin and Beyond. And a lot of that was the base of the original Bitcoin prospectus. So, uh, um, but my real life Bitcoin story is my son had got a scholarship and went off to Andover outside of Boston, a prep school. And uh, his allowance was 200 US a month. So the first month I sent him 200 US and I got a phone call and I go, what's up? He goes, says, dad, I thought my allowance was 200. I said, yeah. He says, well, I only got 160. I look at it. I said, oh yeah, CIBC took 25 bucks and Bank of America took 15. So you only get 160. He goes, no, dad, that's not how it works. And he goes, I go, yes, son, that's exactly how it works. So he says, well, what are we going to do about this? And I said, well, what we'll do is open up a co- an account at Coinbase 
and I'm going to send you one Bitcoin, which was 200 at the time. So I send him one Bitcoin the next month and it goes bing. And he goes, wow, that was fast. That's cool. He kept the Bitcoin. So next month I send him 0.9 Bitcoins. So he goes, dad, you were supposed to send me one Bitcoin. I said, no, Bitcoin went up. So, so I only send you 0.9, which is the $200. He goes, no, dad, that's not how it works. I go, yes, son, that's exactly how it works. So he comes back from school a year later. He's got all this Bitcoin in this wallet. And I'm going, what are you living off of? He says, all that fiat currency in my bank accounts that are devaluing as we speak. And I go, there's my boy. <laughs> so it's, a, it's our, you know, that's how we really got in, in, into Bitcoin. Um, so then we went on the quest to launch the first Bitcoin fund in the world on a major exchange. And really, uh, uh, we looked at a bunch of different things. A lot of people were doing reverse takeovers of mining companies, reverse takeovers of you know different types of funds. And we just said, you know what, let's visit with the OSC and say we want to go on the front door. So we had a the head of the investment funds branch in, at the Ontario Securities Commission was a guy by the name of John Mountain. We had known for years, bright, visionary, kind of really cool guy. He goes, he said, do you want to be the first regulator to approve a Bitcoin fund and list it on a major exchange in the world? He goes, absolutely, let's go. So uh, we, we filed a preliminary prospectus, Chris Berniski and Jack and everybody wrote it. We filed it. Uh, we went through two different editions and it was about to get approved. Then the regulators create this thing called a launch pad to help digital asset companies you know, make it through the regulatory burden faster. Well, it did the exact opposite. It made us stop the approval of the uh, of the Bitcoin fund. And we said, well, how come? They said, well, we want, we don't know if Bitcoin's a currency, a security, or a commodity. And I said, well, that's pretty irrelevant because I'm licensed to manage currencies, securities, and commodities. I don't care what you call it, you know, we have legally constituted this fund. They said, well, you have, but we're regulating you and we want to put terms and conditions to make you as a portfolio manager have the expertise and right to manage a digital asset fund. So that took them about a year. And this was 2017. So Bitcoin went from $600 or $1,200 to $20,000 and then collapsed. And in January, they go, now you're digital asset managers. And we're going, whoopee. <laughs> like, I mean, we just missed the biggest bull market on anything ever, right, for a while. So anyways, we, um, uh, we refiled the prospectus and said, we're going to go again. And we were about to get approved, kind of, we believe, you know, in, in mid-2018. And all of a sudden, John Mountain, who's about to sign off and approve it, he gets a radical prostate cancer, or sorry, radical um, uh, cancer, uh, and, and he dies within like three months of, of, of us being, or three weeks within us being approved, which was pancreatic cancer, sorry. And that was absolutely horrible. It was, uh, and I had just come off a prostate cancer uh, scare and had a radical prostatectomy. And so remember your Movembers and get your PSA checked. Um, so, so John passed away. The new group came in. They just said, yeah, we don't get this Bitcoin thing. There's no way we're going to accept it. So what happens is when a regulator um, rejects uh, a prospectus, what they have to do is they actually have to articulate the reasons why they were rejecting it. And in Canada, they said, look, Here's, it took them six months, and they said, we're rejecting it because we have questions about custody, about auditability, about pricing, about market manipulation. And finally, they always have this magic card called, it's not in the public interest to launch a Bitcoin fund. Well, in Canada, most of you know that we had a couple of disasters with Quadriga CX, an exchange where the guy died in India and took, you know, he took, what was it, 240 million of 110,000 Canadians? And it's not in the public interest to have a regulated fund. Like it made no sense at all. Um, but when, so when they reject it, we looked at their reasons for rejection and we said, we can win this. And we filed uh, basically a petition to go to a public hearing in front of a judge or a commissioner to win the right to launch the first Bitcoin fund in the world. 
And uh, in October, so we did that in the summer of 2019. In October, uh, on Halloween Day, we got the, uh, the results that said we had won on all accounts and we have the right to launch the first Bitcoin fund in the world, which was amazing. We're now like four and a half years and five and a half million dollars into this. And um, the judge's landmark decision was not a simple decision. It was a very complex decision. It said the application that we filed engages the, the foundational concepts of securities legislation in Canada, meaning a regulator, it's not their job to immunize people against volatility, risk taking or technology or anything along those lines. Their job is to make sure that it is legally constituted and safe and secure in the eyes of the law. And we won on, on, on all accounts. Um, the, the biggest one was custody. And this is when the early custody companies were coming out and they had just done with, they'd gone with the bit license now. And so we ended up, there are really three people, you know, where I'd hold a hundred million or a billion dollars of Bitcoin right now. It's either Coinbase, Fidelity or Bitco or, you know, but we selected Gemini. Um, and uh, there's another one of the greatest books ever written, Bitcoin Billionaire. Uh, billionaires. I think it's an amazing story. It was, you read that in one sitting. So anybody who hasn't read one, you have, you've got to read that. So we teamed up with Gemini, and um, uh, and they had were, became SOC two, Type two compliant, everything proper financial institution that works. So we dealt with custody. Then there was auditability. So Grant Thornton Worldwide in Montreal has a group called Cadillac C. The last five years, and Francis Pouliot worked there at, at one point in time, and Jonathan and, and, and everybody else. And they created something called Cadillac C, which was designed to audit blockchain transactions, specifically Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin wallets. So when we went to the, we already were running a multi crypto asset fund, and it had already been audited by Grant Thornton. And they said, yeah, they stood up in front of the, the OSC, says, you can't get it audited. And Grant Thornton's sitting there saying, well, we've audited one and we think we can audit it. So, you know, you know, who's the authority here? Is it Grant Thornton? It is the OSC. So we went on auditability. Pricing was a little more complicated because you couldn't use a single index or a single benchmark or a single exchange. So um, one of our partners, Van Eck, owns 10% of 3IQ, uh, plus or minus. And and Van Eck owns a company called Envis. So Gabor Gerbax and the group at Van Eck created with us, with Sean Cumby, our, our CIO, created the uh, Envis Institutional Bitcoin Index. So we ended up selecting the indexes and washing it of all the noise that shows up in a Bitcoin index. And we believe it's the cleanest Bitcoin index uh, around. So. Uh, we proved to them that, yes, you could price it properly and it wasn't subject to manipulation. Market manipulation was really kind of funny. And I'll just tell you this one story. There was over 10,000 pages of uh, testimony. And the guy for the OSC says, well, you know, there's market manipulation in, on an exchange in China. And he goes, yeah, fine. That exchange isn't in our index. So, But he says, here you're quoting Mr. Bit for next T. He says, do you know Mr. Bit for next T? The guy goes, no. He says, do you think that's his real name? <laughs> he goes, no. He says, well, did you verify his data? Did you, you scrub down into it? Like, I mean, you're the Ontario Securities Commission. You have access to all the data in the world. And he goes, he says, okay. He says, no, I didn't do that. And he goes, okay, well, your next one is Betty B. What's Betty B's last name? <laughs> what does Betty B know about market manipulation? So he, our lawyer proceeded to, on the stand, the whole crowd is sitting there just going, they're listening to this and going, you know, holy smokes. So market manipulation really had nothing to do with us. We're all very familiar with the Bart Simpson uh, chart patterns that you get out of China where it goes straight up and it goes across, it comes straight down or the reverse Bart, upside down Bart Simpson just goes down and comes back up. None of that and ever ends up in the midst of a publicly traded company that's priced at 4 p.m. every every single day. And then again, the final one was not in the public interest. The Ontario Securities Commission always has the right to say, 
It's not in the public interest. So if we're trying to run a uranium, you know, enriched uranium fund, cold storage in North North Korea, they may say it's not in the public interest to do so. <laughs> so um, the judge literally said, even though that not in the public interest carries an awful lot of weight and an awful lot of opportunity, it's not endless. And he says it's not, uh, it can't be used all the time or any time. So we ended up winning on all accounts. And uh, the problem is, so we won on October 31st in, in Ontario. Canada has 12 jurisdictions. So now we had to get approved in 12 other jurisdictions. And then we had to syndicate. We did the 12 other jurisdictions. We got syndicated with none of the big Canadian banks, which is a disappointment. They'll come on, which tells me we're early, right? We're early if, if Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP, when nobody's embracing it, we're early. Because when they embrace it, we're already there. You, you, you get that. You under, understand that. So we're still early. And so we're about to syndicate the beginning of March. And we go, what could possibly go wrong? Well, apparently there's a global pandemic <laughs> that we haven't check the box uh you know we had a free market buck of 100 million dollars it went to zero because every investment advisor in this country was more concerned with protection of wealth of their clients and they were not looking for a new asset class um, we were already running a bitcoin fund of 15 million we rolled that 15 million in went public at 15 million came out did another offering right after just before the halving did 50 million us then did another 15 million us we're doing about two one to two million dollars a day of private placements right now and in the next few weeks the bitcoin fund in canada qbtc.u will be a virtual etf we'll be able to do what are called at the market offerings so you can subscribe to the fund every single day at 4 p.m., get units of the fund, and you can redeem them once a month. So it's virtually an ETF with monthly redemptions and daily subscriptions. So, you know, we're pretty excited about what we're doing in Canada with that. So talk to me about right now the types of people. So you mentioned kind of the capital that you guys have gotten into the fund. Where is that coming from? Is that coming from uh, individuals? Is that coming from kind of wealth managers? Is that coming from family offices, institutions? Like Where are you seeing the demand from? Yeah, so funny enough, it's tiny, right? It's $100 million or you know, $100 million in three months. We have maybe a handful of family offices in Canada, which you know who all the Bitcoin interested family offices are. Uh, we do have, and, and, and this is really the, the real crux of it, Pop, is we have a regulated manager running a regulated fund on a major regulated exchange. So now every mutual fund in the world should be coming to Canada and buying uh, buying into, you know, a part of our Bitcoin fund to have that 1% in their global tech fund. So there are three really, you can probably guess who they are in Canada, tech funds that or global go anywhere asset management funds that understand Bitcoin, they get it. And these are mutual funds that all show up as top performing. I mean, all you have to do is look at ARC and the performance of ARC Web because they bought Bitcoin, you know, four years ago, GBTC four years ago. And, you know, they're one of the best performing ETFs in the United States. So we have a lot of Canadian mutual funds that are looking at putting our Bitcoin fund into their funds. And we hope that that spreads to the U.S. and the rest of the world. Got it. And then you guys also have uh, an Ether fund that is uh, coming down the pipe. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, first of all, we have filed a preliminary prospectus for the Ether fund. So therefore, when you're in... Uh, prospectus offering, you're not allowed to promote or, or talk about it. So the best I can say is, you know, um, you know, uh, it is filed. It is public record that has been filed. We're in the question period of it. We hope that this closes in the next month or so. And any details of that fund can be, you know, you can get the preliminary prospectus from your investment advisor. And that's pretty much all I'm allowed to say about that. 
That's fair. Uh, t- talk a little bit about the Bitcoin fund and kind of where you see this going, right? Do we see an ETF coming down the pipeline? Does this eventually uh, have a pathway to become the ETF? Uh, or do you think that the Bitcoin fund uh, will kind of serve as that exposure uh, for, uh, for a good number of people for, uh, for the persistent future? Yeah. So first of all, um, the answer is, you know, ETFs will come in and, 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 and prevail. And yes, we could convert this into an F, ETF, but we're a virtual ETF today anyways, right? You know, you can subscribe at the end of the day, you know, at NAV plus a little bit or at the market offerings. They're called ATM offerings. Not a lot of people understand what an ATM offering is at the market offering, but Tesla just did a $5 billion ATM mark, uh, offering in the United States. So everybody went, oh, can't, hang on, what's this? So the laws in Canada changed on August 31st. Normally an ATM offering, you couldn't offer more than 10% of your, your capitalization, and you couldn't offer it more than four or five times a year, or whatever the number was. Now you can offer it daily and you can offer it to the maximum. So it's a new type of, of, of what we call an ETF. So it, it, it's virtually an ETF. People will learn what it is. It's kind of like, and Canada was the inventor, by the way, of ETFs. My chairman, Howard Atkinson, literally wrote the book on ETFs. He was, uh, he was at, uh, well, before Horizons and BlackRock and, and everybody else. So, uh, you know, Howard has literally written version one, two, and three of what is an ETF. Um, so we're a virtual ETF right now, and people will have to figure that out and understand it. Having said that, my vision is very different because of the judge's ruling that we have and that we're regulated and Canada is a very safe and and understood jurisdiction. um, We'll be listed, we believe, in Gibraltar offshore jurisdiction in the next three days or five days if they come back to us quickly. Um, We're looking, we've been approached by people um, to list in Europe and places such as Austria um, we've, uh, got a letter of intent to launch in Dubai. Um, we're obviously looking at Singapore. So we're looking at the friendly jurisdictions, but then we passport to London, Hong Kong, and the New York stock exchange or NASDAQ. So we have every intention. There are a lot of restrictions. We can't go into the U S until we are a certain size of a certain track record and everything else. But We'll have the size, we'll have the track record, we'll have everything else. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see through IQ applying for an NYSE listing or uh, an, another listing at some point in time. And just think of you know some of the biggest closed-end funds on the New York Stock Exchange are Sprott Physical Gold, Sprott Physical Silver, that are you know seven eight billion dollar funds you know on the New York Stock Exchange. So Canada, we have access to be able to do those kind of listings. So. We're always up for a good fight, so you know that. So. <laughs> I love it. Talk a little bit uh, about Bitcoin just in general, right? So outside of the fund, kind of how do you see the asset today? Um, and kind of where do you think we're going over the next 18, 24 months? Yeah, so when I was a floor trader in Montreal, I remember seeing the price of something going up. And one of the old-time traders said, uh, more buyers than sellers. So as long as Bitcoin has more buyers than sellers, and, you know, I'm at I'm an honors degree student in economics and an MBA. And if supplies like this and demands like this, the price is the only outlet, right? And, you know, with all respect to, you know, Warren Buffett, one of my longtime heroes, the Bitcoin blockchain is the most powerful secure computer network in the world. And I have no idea how he thinks it's worth zero. If Warren Buffett owned email or live streaming or, you know, <laughs> or voice over internet protocol, Warren Buffett would be even richer than he is today. So why he doesn't own Bitcoin, I don't know, because you can actually own part of the most secure, powerful computer network in the world. And I think a lot of people miss out on the simplicity of the beauty of the technology of what we have here. So you buy Bitcoin for one of three reasons, because it's the most powerful, secure computer network in the world and you want to own it, which I do, or you think it's a store of wealth. Now, the store of wealth, a lot of people have a lot of funny questions about the store of wealth. And when I wrote that article and got gold, silver, and platinum listed on the Montreal Stock Exchange, I mentioned in that article that I thought that platinum would overtake gold as the store of wealth over gold because it was more scarce, 
it is more geographically diversified. You could mine it in, in more places and it had greater industrial uses. So I said platinum should be a better store of wealth than gold. What I forgot was there was already $5 trillion of gold embedded in central banks. And there's no way you could ever amass $5 trillion worth of platinum. By the time we've got $5 trillion of Bitcoin in central banks of the world, and somebody says, well, I believe in blockchain, but I don't like Bitcoin, I'm going, you have no idea what you're talking about. And when you talk about store of wealth, I have $4,000 t-shirts and $2,000 tubes. I bought dinner for people in Venice for 10 Bitcoin. Well, no, I wouldn't do that anymore. I won't spend any Bitcoin. So when people tell me, you know, if you can't, Bitcoin will never get a bid till you can buy something with it. And I said, that's why I wrote a white paper with Custom Frank, and it's on uh, Medium, about for Bitcoin to really hit hyper growth, $4 trillion a day of Forex fiat is traded every day. Until you get those traders taking their phone and going, I'm trading US dollars for Canadian dollars, instantaneous settlement, bing, bang, zoom, for Japanese yen, for you know euros, for British pounds. Until they start doing that and going, holy crap, I don't want to own any of these fiat currencies. And now you're selling your US dollars and buying Bitcoin, or you're selling your Canadian dollars and buying Bitcoin, or your yen and buying Bitcoin. Until we can, as a whole group, get Forex traders to understand that stable coins will be used as a means of currency, but stable coins are either going to be on the Bitcoin blockchain through liquid, or they're going to be on, you know, or regular, uh, you know, or they're going to be on, you know, Ether or any one of the others, other blockchains. So until the world starts trading digital currencies, we own a company called half half a company with uh, Mavenet Systems out of Canada called Canada Stable Corp. And uh, I'm going to pitch that to your private equity company one, at some point in time because I love the new fund that you just created. Um, but Canada Stable Corp, you know, we sat down with a bank, famous bank, and a famous asset manager, and we did a four million dollar bond trade that settled in T plus three, T plus three seconds, at a cost of two tenths of a cent. So if anybody who denies that all securities trading, all bond trading and everything is going blockchain based and Bitcoin is not the US dollar standard of the blockchain, well, they're just not getting it yet, right? So, and I'm preaching to the converted, so. Well, they just um, haven't paid it. They haven't paid attention, right? They haven't done the work. They haven't spent the time to actually understand how much more superior this is, I think, right? Yeah, and, and, and again, getting involved in stable coins, it's going to take, you know what, are we, we're year, uh, you know, 12 a bit in Bitcoin. It, email was invented in, two, in 1982. Most people didn't get their first email to, in Canada until BlackBerry went from being a little pager system into an email system in 1994, really. So it took 12 years for people to adopt email. For them to adopt digital currencies and everything else is going to maybe take another, you know, another while. So we are so early in this growth pattern. And same with voice over internet protocol. When that was invented, you know, we didn't start using Zoom and, and, and Skype and everything for another 14, 15 years. Now we're 20 years. So people's time horizons are way too short. And that's why I say, you know, when Bitcoin goes from 1,000 to 20,000 in 2017, yippee, it was easily the biggest short I've ever seen in my entire life. For people to be buying into the futures, I could see all those futures traders going, this is going to be the biggest short or easiest short, apart from, you know, mortgages and the <laughs> during the mortgage crisis, you know, in 2008. So it was easily the big short for me uh, as far as I was concerned, not because I didn't like it, but Bitcoin's price has followed its growth pattern, its adoption rate. You know, there's no brain surgery here. Stock to flow, anything safety now, uh, safety Dean talks about, all of this, the more power it gets, the more people want it, the more people want it, the more powerful it gets, the more secure it gets, and it goes round and round. These are all brilliant people, and these hedge fund guys, you know, uh, are amazing. I was really, um, uh, I watched your podcast, the guy from MicroStrategy, <laughs> and how he ended up with his, 
is investment in it, you know, yeah, there's a bit of a rolling of the dice there, but the reality is, you know, it's not going away, right? It, 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 it's He's probably more right than wrong, right? Michael Saylor from MicroStrategy, who put 85% of his balance sheet, to $500 yeah. million, put 425 million bucks of it into uh, into Bitcoin. So, yeah. but, a couple but he had of my a- early shareholders, and a guy named Greg Foss, who loves to talk about fiat and, and, and currencies, you know, the guy is brilliant. He knows everything about trading, about money, about governments about bond trading and he knows all the weaknesses that you should follow him at Greg Foss. Um, he's, he's absolutely amazing and point on. Um, but again, he's a maximalist and you have to adopt his enthusiasm. I, I'm enthusiastic, but I'm looking at the entire infrastructure together. Um, but when people say, it's blockchain I like and not Bitcoin, that's when I shake my head and I'm going, you haven't even... You haven't even started to understand it yet, and that's that's right. That's the signal that they're starting, yeah. Right? It yeah. is uh, there's this like continuum you have to go on, and then eventually you get back to uh, hey, this Bitcoin thing is probably going to be pretty valuable in the future. Exactly. Yeah. What what um what what else are you excited about in terms of just the build out of infrastructure, right? So you guys have done a ton, obviously, in, in getting uh, the 3IQ, the Bitcoin fund, uh, approved and, and kind of onto uh, onto the exchange. What else do you see as important milestones here to help a lot of these investments uh, or investors and asset allocators come into uh, come into Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, we're going to be really early. So if you think of a couple things, you know. Let's just talk about like what would 3IQ have on a product line in the basis. Everything that's going on with DeFi is amazing, right? Like BlockFi, you, you know, uh, I think, you know, Morgan Creek might be in there, but, you know, Zach Prince and what they built there is, is, is beautiful. It's a whole new lending management infrastructure. You know, there's no reason I can't start creating literally money market funds paying 8% Canadian dollars using my, you know, uh, stable coins and or my big coins and hedging the positions out. So how well accepted would a, you know, as far as we're concerned, a, you know, a DeFi digital asset um, money market fund look? I think it'd be amazing. And, you know, you're going to get income, 7 8% of income. Well, versus what? 0.6 on a 10-year? Like, forget it. So. So um, I think there's an awful lot of opportunities in there. And you know that we're obviously looking at those. Um, I do think the, uh, you know, when you start to see uh, the traditional banking methods, um, and, and let's talk about central banks for a second. The government, Central Bank of Canada could not create a stable coin. Yes, they could. They already have it. You know, they, you know, they can program one. But if all Canadians are going to hold their money at the Central Bank of Canada, what do we do with the most amazing banking sector in the world? You know, we've got seven to 10 banks, mostly five, and that are very powerful. It's not broken, well capitalized. Canadians don't have any banking issues or banking problems. So why would the Central Bank of Canada want to F that up, right? Well, they wouldn't. So basically what will happen is a central currency is going to be held by deposits because it'll be back one to one. So all the Canadian banks will start competing for the deposits of my stable coin. And they won't let that happen very long. They'll just take it out and say, okay, QCAT is now owned by all the Canadian banks in, you know, in, in my version vision, but then every credit card loyalty program. And in Canada, we've got Canadian tire, Hudson Bay company, Tim Hortons. These are brand names like, you know, it would be like your Starbucks or your, you know, Kroger's or any of these kind of people. So, so any of those programs start p- companies start adapting uh, stable coins. I think that's when you see the entire infrastructure go up, and that's when Bitcoin really skyrockets. I tend to think that uh, what Zach has built is just the start for uh, for BlockFi, but also we're going to see many, many more entrepreneurs follow in terms of building out this uh, 
what really ends up being just a mirror image of the legacy financial world in terms of providing all the financial infrastructure that allows Bitcoin to thrive, right? And, and if you kind of think about over the last 11 years, Bitcoin has grown from, you know, essentially on nobody's radar, you know, a, you know, basically worth zero or three tenths of a penny uh, to today being worth kind of ten, eleven thousand uh, dollars and now kind of the talk of finance. That's all without a lot of infrastructure along the way, right? Yes, you had the coin bases and exchanges and things like that, but all the things that you're used to in the financial services industry really haven't been around and, and they're coming online now. But fast forward 10 more years, right? And I always joke with people, you think more people are going to hold Bitcoin or less, right? In 10 years from now, you think okay. it's going to be easier to use or less useful, right? And so it tends to be, uh, you know, pretty much a no brainer, in my opinion, as to uh, kind of the, the world that we're, uh, we're headed towards, but uh, not everyone sees it that way. Well, we'll take a piece from the, uh, the Disney fund and create the Bitcoin Children's Education Fund. How's that sound? So everybody can start saving for their kids' education in Bitcoin. See how see where they're in 20 years. You know, I have no idea how you finance your kids to go to university in the United States. Right? It's, it's crazy. crazy. Not the University of Toronto. <laughs> it's crazy. It it is literally insane, right? It, it, and the, the secret is that most of them aren't doing it. Their kids are just taking on, you know, two hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt to uh to go to college. It's gonna yeah. be a pretty bad um you know, uh, foot to start on, if you will, right? Yeah. Given the, uh, the the problems, so we hope to help solve a lot of those problems. And and again, Pop, a lot comes from you know, for us, it's not Bitcoin or gold. An investment advisor should own both. Um, it's not it's not radical. It's not this. You know, when we filed our Ethereum fund, uh, I, I can't say, but we have certain opinions that they're not novel investments anymore. They're twelve years old. And yes, it did take, while we were doing all of this, Gemini was working with us step-by-step step to get their SOC 1, SOC 2, Type 1, Type 2 audit things. They were getting their regulatory licenses. None of this happened fast, and none of it was there two years ago or a year and a half ago, right? And that's why, you know, Grayscale's on a non-regulated uh, exchange. We think a regulated exchange has advantages. So now pension funds, they can't overweight their OTC holdings or now, you know, family offices that say we need certain, you know, uh, regulatory prospectuses around investments that we'll invest in. We think we've now broken that. And the way I look at it is, yes, the OSC rejected us and the new group that came in, they challenged us to take it to the highest possible level to get the proper approval. So we can easily say there's 10,000 pages of testimony approved by a regulator, um, approved by a regulator who did four years of due diligence and rang us, run us through the biggest ringer to make sure due diligence was properly done. So we easily believe QBTC.U is the cleanest, most powerful product in, you know, in the market today. I love it. Before we get into the rapid fire questions, uh, what is the place where people can find you on the internet or find out more about the Bitcoin fund? Yeah, www.3iq.ca, not .com.ca. Um, that's for Canada, the great white north. And um, on there, you'll have everything. How many Bitcoin per unit? You know, what's our, our challenge is, is we're trading at a 19% premium and our competitors are trading at a 9% premium today. And I'm going, I need to get my premium down. I need people to sell my Bitcoin fund, not buy it. They're all buying it. I need them to sell it to get it down. So we hope to manage the premium a little better when we have at the market, our ETF comes out in, in the next couple of weeks. But yeah, visit us there. And as I said, for Canadians, again, you get to put it in retirement accounts and then tax free savings account, something that we have here. And, you know, it can change your life. If you're 23 years old, you can place a $10,000 investment. But if it goes up 10x or 100x, you've missed out on an amazing opportunity. So I love that. Uh, I asked the same two questions to everybody to wrap up. And then you're going to get to ask me one. First is what's the most important book you've ever read? Um, yeah. The most not the most important book I, I, I've ever read, but recently the one that I read that was the most fun was literally Bitcoin Billionaires. And the way he writes and his TV show 
And everything he does is amazing. I was absolutely, you know, fascinated by it. And and I like a good, a feel good story, you know, other than that, uh, uh, I read for escapism, but I'm also a big sailor. So most of the important things I read are about weather patterns, <laughs> wave patterns, and, you know, what do you do when your hurricane's coming and you're sitting in the middle of the ocean, your sailboat, these are, so I'll read educational uh, stuff mostly, um, and then anything industry oriented, so, uh, but um, and I'd be remiss to say if I didn't mention Jack Tater and Chris Bernisky's book, but we're getting a little dated. We need we need version two, Jack, if you're listening. Those are uh, great suggestions. Uh, second question is more fun. Aliens, believer or non-believer? Oh, I'm going to have to quote and sing. You know, uh, the late David Bowie, there's a star man waiting in the sky He'd like to come and see you, but he thinks he'll blow your mind. There, so there's a star man waiting, but he'll blow our mind. Absolutely. That one of the best writers and one of the greatest songs ever written. That is a fantastic way to answer that question. No one has ever said that. <laughs> you can ask me one question to finish up. What you got for me, Fred? Well, how big are you going to make your, why did you get into venture capital and how big are you going to make your venture capital and how exciting is it? I want to really know how you've gone because that's obviously, you know, you're half my age, but you know, at some point in time, that's what I'd like to do. Tell me about what, why you did that because I'm really fascinated. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've been doing it now for four years or so, uh, and there was no grand plan. But if you kind of look with hindsight bias, uh, there's definitely this belief that uh, companies have been staying private longer. Most of the gains have been occurring in the private market. Um, there are still great opportunities in the public market. It's just that, you know, kind of the public market companies, all of the private market value was already sucked out of them, right, by the uh, the private market investors. And so uh, that game ends up uh, having a uh, attractiveness to a specific type of investor. Uh, if you like to uh, be less kind of what are the, you know, financials and what's the cash burn and the OPEX and, and kind of actually looking at financial statements, uh, you're probably more of a public market type investor. Uh, but in the earliest stages of uh, building these companies, uh, there really isn't any of that, right? And so what you're doing is uh, you're basically optimistically believing in a person uh, and in a vision they have for something that they want to create. Uh, but that's why there's such great returns available to investors is uh, these entrepreneurs are literally dedicating years of their life uh, to not only recruit other smart, intelligent, hardworking, ambitious people uh, to work on hard problems, but also of their own you know, personal sacrifices with themselves, their families, etc. Uh, to go build these businesses. And literally, they are creating this stuff out of thin air um, and, and kind of building value. Uh, and the hope is that those companies will capture that value. Uh, and so I just really enjoy that, right? I mean, it, there's now, uh, I've been doing it long enough to have multiple founders who pitched me uh, an idea uh, and a problem that they were going to go solve uh, to the point where they've grown big enough to see they're doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. Right, and it's just really cool to see you know somebody who set out to uh, to do something, uh, and kind of through all the obstacles, all the challenges, uh, get there. And and uh, so for me, it's you know, yeah, sure, we can make some money uh, doing this, but at the same time, uh, it, it's much more just about watching these founders uh, kind of build this stuff. And and uh, I personally just get enjoyment out of this whole idea of you know betting on somebody early. Uh, on their journey to go do something. And if they're successful, uh, it's a pretty cool ride to be along for. Yeah, moving from a user of capital to a provider of capital has got to be the day that you put a big smile on your face. And congratulations on everything you've accomplished. I'm a big fan, as you know. <laughs> Absolutely, Fred. Well, listen, I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing as well. And I, I think that uh, you guys are just getting started. So we will uh, we will have to do this again, my friend, uh, at some point when you guys have more news. But uh, just keep going because I know that what, uh, what you guys have done so far is not easy. And, uh, and kind of where the ambitions lie uh, are, are even harder. So uh, just uh, just keep going for all of us. Great. Thanks. Great seeing you.